Good, e good evening, everyone. I want to welcome you guys to our Good Friday evening of reflection. I'm Pastor Nate, the lead pastor here at Grace. Um, and we're just glad that we have a chance today uh, to spend some time with you. <clears throat> Earlier today at 12 o'clock, we had a Good Friday service, and you can go on Facebook and you can check that out and connect with us there and have a chance to watch that. And tonight, we're just going to take 20 to 30 minutes um, and just read through the story of the crucifixion, read through the story of the final um, hours of Jesus' life um, <clears throat> during, this, during that time. Um, and just spend some time in reflection, look at some things and talk about some things as we, as we uh, get a little bit deeper, as we spend a little bit of time just truly um, understanding, truly embracing the sacrifice that he would make. And so I'm going to start us off with prayer and then we're going to begin. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we are grateful for the sacrifice that you would make. The sacrifice, God, that we honor today, that we reflect on today. I pray, Lord, as we read your word, as we read the scriptures, God, that you would illuminate in our hearts and minds the truth of what you went through. Lord, for those that maybe have never heard this story, God, we pray that it would have a life-changing impact, that they would recognize what you went through, they would recognize the need for salvation. For those of us that maybe have spent a lot of time in this story and have seen the movies and, and, and read these stories and heard sermons time and time and time again, I pray today something would, would, would uh, illuminate in our lives something new, something different. That when tonight is done, we'll have, have grown closer to you. That when tonight is done, we will have a deeper understanding of your love for us. God, we pray that you continue to watch over us, continue to protect us, continue to take care of us as individuals, as families, as neighborhoods, as communities, Lord. Continue to watch over our nation during these difficult times. We love you, Lord. We praise you. And we are so grateful for the sacrifice that you would make for us so long ago, but yet today just has as much of an impact as it did then. We thank you and praise you in your name. Amen. So join us as we reflect this evening on Good Friday and what went on with that. I'd like to start off by reading a scripture that we read earlier today as we talked about from garden to garden. John eleven twenty five 25 says this, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. And they said to him, Where will you have us prepare it? And he said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters. And tell the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished, prepare it there. And they went and found it just as he had told them and, and they prepared the Passover. And when the hour came, he reclined at a table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And then 
they began to question one another which of them it could be who was going to do this. The Passover has been celebrated for thousands of years. When Jesus sat with his disciples to observe and to honor the miracle of Passover, they had no clue what was coming. Jesus stepped back into history to show the miracle of Passover, pointing to the promise of the coming Savior. When he took the bread, change began. Jesus would tie himself directly to the element of a timeless observation. He was the bread broken and shared so humanity could experience a connection to God not easily achieved. When he took the cup of redemption, it still didn't connect for them. The pieces had not fallen into place for them yet. He was the lamb that would be slain. His blood would cross the doorposts covering our sins, providing salvation for humanity. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as one of who serves. For who is the greater one who reclines at table or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as the one who serves. You are those who have stayed with me in my trials, and I assign to you, as my Father assigned to me, a kingdom that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. At such a time as this, they would debate who is the greatest. Hours before Jesus would experience the most severe brutality of man, they argued. Had they not witnessed the multiple acts of servanthood? They were there when Jesus washed their feet in humbleness. They also witnessed Mary's act of love as she poured oil on Jesus' feet. They heard his teachings regarding this very thing, but at this moment, they were missing the mark. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times that you know me. Was this one of the hardest things Jesus would ever say? When Jesus called him to put down his nets, that he was calling him to fish for men, did he know? Did he know that one of his, one of his closest would deny him soon, so, so soon? And he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. When he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The beginning of the sacrifice that would save mankind 
came before a single lash was given. The first drops of blood that he would shed would begin in that garden, an olive grove where the oil would be crushed out. Yet even in the midst of this, of his agony, of this agony, he recognized the importance of obedience when he declared, not my, but his will be done. While he was still speaking, there came a crowd, and the man called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And when those who were around him saw what would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. But Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. And then Jesus said to the chief priests and the officers of the temple and elders who had come out against him, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. The one who followed Jesus for so long would be the one who would hand him over to the enemy. The betrayal of Judas would be swift. Then in the midst of his arrest, Jesus again would show love. When the servant of his accuser had his ear cut off, Jesus healed it and went willingly. Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, This man was with him, but he denied. He denied it by saying, Woman, I did not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly this man also was with him, for he is not is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter, and Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Absolutely heartbreaking, the moment surrounding Peter's denial. Even after he had been warned of what was coming, Peter found himself in three situations that out of fear he would choose to deny his connection with Jesus. What must have Peter, uh, Peter felt when the rooster crowed? When the Lord, his Lord turned and looked at him, what went through Peter's mind? Such a different place to be in for the one who declared you are the Christ, the son of the living God. What Peter didn't know was that he would be asked a question in triplicate in the near future. Do you love me? When the day came, the assembly of the elders of the people gathered together, both chief priests and scribes. And they led him away to their council, and they said, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. So they all said, Are you the Son of God then? And he said to them, You say that I am. Then they said, What further testimony do we need? We've heard it ourselves from his own lips. Then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him 
saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they were urgent, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout Judea from Galilee even to this place. But they all cried out together, Away with this man and release, it, and release to us Barnabas, a man who has been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus, but they kept shouting, Crucify! Crucify him! A third time he said to them, Why? What evil has he done? I have found in him no guilt deserving death. I will therefore punish and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified. And their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. He released, he released the man who was thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, for whom they asked but he delivered Jesus over to their will. The proper legal proceedings would have exonerated Jesus, but that is not what happened. The one could have cried out for justice. There, were not, there would not be ears to listen. Pilate attempted to satisfy the religious leaderships, but that failed. They wanted Jesus dead. The same crowds that recently cried out, Hosanna, Hosanna now shouted, crucify, crucify him. They even chose a murderer to be shown grace and mercy, but there would be none for Jesus from humanity. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him, and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take yourselves, take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat on the judgment seat at, at a place called the Stone Pavement and in Aramic Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. 
They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. The Romans knew how to punish a man. They excelled at it. Strike after strike and blow after blow hit the body of Jesus as he was sentenced to brutality. Jesus was in the hands of professionals who beat him to the point of unrecognition. The lamb's blood was being shed at the hands of the very ones he came to save. On top of the physical beatings, the mockery would continue. He was given a purple robe fit for a king, but not done out of respect, but out of humiliation. Thorns twisted to form a punishing crown would be forced onto his head. The king of kings mocked as a criminal, and yet that was not enough. They wanted it all from Jesus. They wanted his life. Like Jesus had done so many times, his response was powerful. You have no authority over me at all unless it has been given you from above. Pilate would give Jesus over to be crucified. And as they led him away, they seized one Simon of Cyrene who was coming in from the country and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. And there followed him a great multitude of the people and of women who were mourning and lamenting for him. But turning to them, Jesus said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breast that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now, when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly, this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home, beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. 
Jesus would drag the heavy cross and the weight of the world on his shoulders. He would make the long journey to the place called the skull, weakened from blood loss, the lack of rest and food. A stranger named Simon would have his name forever attached to the story of the crucifixion as he was forced to carry the cross in aid of Jesus. The cross was an ingenious way to take the life of one who hung on it. Its victim would slowly weaken until they couldn't hold themselves up and would suffocate. While Jesus' body slowly gave way to death, he would proclaim seven phrases that would challenge all of humanity. Number one, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Luke 23, 34. Forgiveness for those who crucified him, yet also for all of humanity. Two, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Luke 23, 43. Nailed to a cross with two common thieves, one who would mock, but one who would recognize Jesus as the Christ. That thief is in paradise. Three, Jesus would say to his mother, woman, this is your son. Then he would say to the disciple, this is your mother. John 19, verse 26 and 27. A beautiful scene of the love of a son to his mother, making sure that she is taken care of by the only disciple who is at the foot of the cross. Four, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew 27, 46 and Mark 15, 34. The entirety of sin would be poured out onto Jesus. He that knew no sin would become sin so we could be saved. Five, I thirst, John 19, 28. A glimpse into the exhaustion that Jesus had endured, like the runner finishing a race and needing water, but a deeper reminder that Jesus had given all to save mankind, the water of life. Six, when Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished, and bowed his head and handed over the spirit. John 19, 30. To tell us die, proclaiming the work is done. Salvation had come to mankind through the sacrifice of Jesus, our Christ. And seven, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Luke 23, 46. The final phrase, the final statement of one of the most powerful moments in human history. We celebrate one of those during Christmas, another today, and one more very soon. Now there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Armathia, and he was a member of the council, a good and righteous man who had not consented to their decision and action, and he was looking for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down and wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid him in a tomb cut in stone where no one had ever yet been laid, and it was the day of preparation. And the Sabbath was beginning. The woman who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. They, then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. Jesus would be taken off the cross and placed in a tomb provided by Joseph of Arimathea. Prophecy after prophecy would be fulfilled in the moments leading up to the death of Jesus on the cross and the moments afterwards. A stone would be rolled in the entrance and guards placed at the tomb. The followers of Jesus would question, wonder, doubt, as the stillness of the Sabbath would come to an end. Luke 24, 1 and 2 says this, but on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Father, we come before you, and as we spent this time in reflecting, Lord, on, on, on what happened that night, 
as we spend time, Lord God, reflecting on what happened over the course of those hours, God, as you suffered, as Jesus sacrificed, as Jesus functioned in full submission, surrender, and obedience to you. We as humanity were able to see where we were given the gift of salvation and able to see restoration of a relationship with you. God, we saw the agony that he suffered. We saw, we reflected on the pain that he endured. We saw the hatred and the anger that was unleashed on him by mankind. Yet Jesus' response was continued in love. We watched him and we saw him, God, uh, uh, cry out to you. We watched and saw the humanity of, of him as he checked and made sure his mother would be taken care of. We watched forgiveness, forgiveness ushered in for humanity. And they laid him in the tomb, believing it was over. They put a stone in the, in the way. They put guards there to, to keep the disciples from, from stealing his body. They put, they, they, they put things in place to, to stop, to shut this all down. The disciples were scared. They were worried. They were doubtful. And yet, God, you had a plan in all of that. The plan wasn't for Jesus to be dead and gone. The plan wasn't for Jesus' body to rot in a tomb like, like, like everyone else's. The plan all along was for salvation to come to humanity through the perfect sacrifice that would be Jesus Christ. And as we reflect, Lord, on the sacrifice that you would make, as we reflect, Lord, on the experience that you would go through in those final hours, we can't stop there. And we can't end there. But we end in the glory that three days later you would rise from the dead, sin, death, defeated. And we now live and we now function and we now move forward in victory in the name of your son through the sacrifice that he would willingly and obediently and submissively and surrendering he would make for us. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son. God, we are so grateful for that gift. That whoever would believe wouldn't perish, wouldn't die, wouldn't spend eternity separated to him, but would have eternity with you, God. We are so grateful for this gift. We're so grateful for this sacrifice. And we are so grateful for the resurrection that's coming. Things may look dark. Things may look dim. But morning is coming. And a glorious morning that will be. Your word says, for the sorrow may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Resurrection Sunday is coming, Lord. And we are so grateful for what you've done for us. We thank you. We praise you in your name. <clears throat> Amen. I just want to thank all of you for coming out and for joining us. I want to thank all of you for spending these moments with us as we reflected on the crucifixion. We reflected on what Jesus Christ would experience. I challenge to you to go back and read the story. Go through and read Luke and read John and read you know, Matthew, Mark. Go through and read this story for yourself. Don't just listen to our words here, but read the story for yourself. Understand and see what Jesus did for you, what he was willing to give up so that we could be saved, so that we could have a relationship with him. The Bible says that all that call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. If you don't have a relationship with him, call upon his name. And we're grateful for this opportunity that we had to connect with you. We hope that you're blessed by this. This Sunday, we get to celebrate Easter Sunday a little bit differently than, 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 than most of us have in the past done. We get to celebrate it online, but we get to celebrate it in our homes with our family and our friends. Join us this Sunday at 11 o'clock as we celebrate the resurrection, as we continue on in our series, 
called Buried Alive as we continue on and we look at the resurrection of Jesus Christ and just what that means for us. Again, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you were blessed. Continue to pray for you. Continue to pray for our nation. If you guys need anything, please get a hold of us. We love you, and thank you guys for joining us. See you guys on Sunday.